and welcome to AFI Fest 2020, presented by Audi. I'm Claudia Puig, Senior Programmer for AFI Fest. And first, I want to thank all the supporters of our festival, our presenting sponsor, Audi, our AFI members, and you, our audience. I'm so happy to be here today with director Maya Cozier, writer Melina Brown, and lead actor Onessa Nestor, who plays Sparkle. <laughs> I love that name because it's so perfect. You sparkle. <laughs> Um, thank you all, and, and I know uh, you're beaming in from Trinidad, you're beaming in from LA, and we really appreciate your being here. Um, this is such a wonderful celebration of sisterhood, of dance, of the sheer sensual joy of movement, and it's also a really moving coming of age tale. Um, audiences really get like a potent sense of the vibrant life in Trinidad and also of soca music and its energy, so thank you for this wonderful film. I wanted to ask you because originally, Maya, this was a short that you developed into a full length feature. So um, you and Melina jump in any time um, to sort of explain how that happened. We actually wrote a feature length film first. <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, so, yeah, I was in Trinidad at the time and Melina was in New York. So we wrote this virtually, Skyping each other every week. Uh, because I was on the ground, I was able to interview people in person. So I did a lot of the on the ground interviewing. Um, but yeah, Melina and I developed this feature length film and we then had to figure out how to get it made. <laughs> um, and, so, and so that was one step. and. And so we decided we would shoot a 10 to 13 minute pitch and sort of use that pitch to show, you know, some of the scenes that we thought were already working in the feature. And luckily enough, even though we shot this short film to pitch the feature length film, it was such a learning experience for me as a director and even Melina as a writer and Onessa as an actress because it was the first time a lot of us were doing all of these things. It was Anessa's first time ever acting in anything. Wow, um, wow. So I think we just kind of used that short, yes, as a pitch, but as an opportunity to start like figuring out the world of this film. Yeah. That's fascinating that you were, uh, that's an unusual progression. Melina, yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about what that was like to be long distance collaborating like that? Yeah, it actually worked out very well. Maya and I sat down, I think we had brunch one day at one of our favorite uh, Jama Jamaican brunch spots in New York. And we sort of brought these ideas together of um, what Maya wanted uh, for the film. And since we had that sit down, it all came together very quickly. I think we had a draft after the interviews in about a month or two. Yeah. And uh, while the short was originally supposed to be a proof of concept, it did sort of take on a life of its own under my Maya's direction. And um, so much came to life very quickly. And when we went back to rewrite the feature for the final project, we had so much insight. It was the first, it was my first full feature. Um, and it was, it just came together so organically, so quickly. Um, it was a, it was a feat for all of us, I think. <laughs> that just, it's, it's so great when a project has kind of a life of its own like that. It just, yeah, gels. Ones, I want to ask you about your first time acting. To be, to have your very first role and to have it be a lead role and to be the star, that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. How did this come about? How did you guys meet each other? I saw the audition online and I passed it because I'm like, Come on, I, I can't do this. But um, one of my dance teachers um, sent it to me in my inbox um, because it was it was based on dance as well. So I, I actually auditioned to be a dancer, an extra dancer. And I showed up to the audition and Maya was like, I want to see you do sparkle. I was like, that's <laughs> Because yeah, I prepared for like two other roles and she was like, no, I don't do that. I want to see you do sparkle. And I was so nervous because I'm like, I sit up all night running these lines for these other rules. And she's like, do sparkle. I didn't even get it. Yeah, I don't even remember that. Like, yeah, I had you for another role. Because they not sent me the uh -huh. email. They sent me Shan yeah. and... What's the other one? And Mika. Oh, okay. So oh, okay. I spent Shana and Mika all night and I showed up to the audition. <laughs> I didn't even get to do any of their miles. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I was wondering was everybody, were they, so everybody was a dancer who 
wanted to be an actor or were they dancer actors or were they, because I, I know sometimes it's like, it, it's easier, if someone's already a dancer, you can have, you can teach someone to act, but if they're an actor, you can't really teach them to dance. Yeah, we had a very unconventional casting process from the start for this. Um, I, for the short, we did an open call um, for an audition, so we had a combination of actors and dancers coming. Interestingly enough, we ended up only casting dancers um, for all of the roles, and for the feature, um, we, we did in-person auditions, but we also, I also reached out to people on Instagram. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think the casting process was very unconventional in that way. The girl that we cast as Mika, I messaged her on Instagram, I, and I thought, you know, she had a vibe, she was kind of interesting, I thought she would fit for the role. Um, so yeah, the casting process was really exciting because, you know, we didn't really cast from actors, we cast from everyday people and dancers, and, and that was, exciting within itself yeah now do i did i read that your background was as a dancer as well so uh so it must be easier if you know something about dance to be able to direct people who are dancing yeah um, for sure yeah i mean this film was so exciting to shoot because i felt like for my entire teenage life i was just around a, a all girl crew clique you know and we were dancing and and it was just so funny after school we would get together and try to imitate beyonce videos i mean that was my teenage life and i <laughs> felt like bringing that dynamic that i was so familiar with as a teenager to screen was just felt like such a natural progression and all the characters that make up this this team of girls in a way kind of draw from my closest friends. So I, I mean, I was very timid as a teenager, so I yeah. felt like I very, very much connected to the character of Sparkle, but, um, you know, Diamond, who's the leader, there was always a leader in the group when we were growing up. There was always a girl who said, <laughs> okay, this is how it's gonna go. Everyone was, <laughs> was always the leader. There was always, you know, Mika, the bubbly, sort of supportive, you know, friendly one. So I felt like, it was just like writing about my friends in a way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so that experience of dancing and being on and off stage and constantly surrounded by that energy, um, you know, just felt like something that I wanted to tap into and it fell back. Yeah. By the way, we figured out who Diamond was in your clique. Who was Oh, yeah. you did? <laughs> yeah. You met her later? <laughs> yeah, I have a really good friend, Chandel. She did, she grew up with me and she was a dancer as well, but she did all the wardrobe and our direction for the film because she ended up going to fashion school in New York. Um, so growing up, she was the diamond. <laughs> but it's funny that she would say that because she worked on the film as well yeah. as wardrobe. And she <laughs> shined bright like a diamond. <laughs> oh, that's so funny that you picked it out that you could tell that it was her too. That's great. So Melina, how did you originally meet Maya or did you have a background in dance? How did, how did your background come into all this? I, I came to film school in New York and Maya and I were going to sort of like congruent uh, film schools. Um, and I had a mutual friend who was also in animation and we were just introduced through the same little culture of artists that sort of came about going to art school in New York City. Um, and that was really great. Maya was, Sort of coming out of this school experience but doing really well on the festival circuit in trinidad and in new york um but had the fire to grab that and capitalize it and me coming uh to the tail end of my college experience was really excited by that and wanted to jump on that train and put in the work too so that's sort of how we came together um that's so. that's very cool so what was so the inspiration for the original story came from your life but you also have a background, I understand, Maya, in, in music videos, directing music videos? Yeah, I um, direct music videos as well. So I've worked with um, Caribbean artists. I, the last music video I did was with Cranium, who's uh, a really um, amazing dancehall artist and signed to Atlantic Records. And yeah, so I think I've always, I mean, there is that sort of connection between, you know, the music video world and this world that we both, you know, develop. Um, yeah. And I wanted to find out how much, and you obviously, you, you created a really wonderful nuanced character on the page, but then Onessa brought so much to it, so much more depth to it too. So I wanted to understand a little bit, or have you explained a little bit about, you know, the intriguing character of Sparkle, because she's at a turning point, at kind of a moment of transformation in her life, it seems like. 
so how did you come up with the details of her character and her circumstance? That was everything that we did. When we set out to start this project, we found these four characters and we put everything into making them as real and pop off the page as we could. And we took, we started with some interviews to get the feel and, and the language of some of the dancers that were already in the community, the Maya knew. Um, but essentially, we wanted Sparkle to have a little bit of piece of every girl at that point in her life, but also feel realized as a, as a whole person and not just necessarily a character that things happen to. She has some agency in her life. Exactly, exactly. And it was, it's really gratifying to hear that all the characters stand out in the way that they do and that they're each so distinct and all their personalities and that everybody can sort of find themselves in the group um, because that was really, really important to us um, to sort of make it an every girl experience, but also very, you know, uh, specific. Absolutely. So Anessa, did you rehearse um, in advance or how did you get into the mind of Sparkle? I didn't, I didn't do so much rehearsing as, as, as much, but like I tried to like memorize the lines and most of the work that we did was between the cast and Maya and directing as we, we go along. Yeah. I mean, I think Sparkle's character is one that so many teenage girls can relate to because essentially she has this vision for herself and for her life and what she wants and she goes after it. She pursues that even though she gets pushed back from her grandfather. And I think, you know, that that is something that so many of us can relate to. And I remember Melina and I talking about this, like when you're when you're at that moment or you know in when you're at that moment of girlhood and being a teenager, a lot of it is performance. Like you're trying to figure out how <laughs> this works. So you might look at another girl who seems like she's confident, she has all the together, like, and you do really awkward things, like flick your hair. And I felt like um, that, that sort of element was something that um, Onessa just naturally brought to the character. And, and I remember always telling her, like, just kind of relax into being yourself. Being yourself yeah. um, you know, like, you know, and, and that's kind of how we work together to developing this, yeah. This is a woman-centered story too, because we see far too few of those. Um, do you, as filmmakers, um, both Melina and, and Maya, do you feel strongly about prominently featuring women who are sort of taking charge of their own narratives and making decisions and taking action? Is that something? Yeah, I mean, it's so important to tell stories where the women have agency. And, you know, one of my favorite scenes in this whole, <laughs> one of my favorite moments um, is when Diamond pulls Skinny aside and she says, listen, do what I, she doesn't pick the dances that she wants. And she says, no, listen, you, you pick Mika, <laughs> you know, like she's taking <laughs> charge and she's in control. And yeah. he just does the dance and he's like, okay. And he does what, you know, he does what <laughs> So I think it was just so important for us to like show women that, that, you know, have agency, that, that are, you know, making decisions, they're independent, they're finding ways to go out and go after what they want. Um, you know, they're making money, Diamond has her own apartment. There's so much independence and there's so much um, that we find important, especially shifting the gaze and making sure that they're not just objects in the background, but they're at the forefront of the story and we're with you know, spark, we are with a woman's point of view throughout and we're seeing the world through her eyes. Um, and that she's not just a plot device, but she's actively making decisions and, and doing things and thinking and making mistakes even, which is it's just all part of the experience. I feel like for the majority of all the experiences that we wanted to show on film, uh, the dancing and the performance is sort of paralleled as a metaphor for all the performative things that uh, we as teenage girls went through moving through the world and figuring out our identities and that was definitely something that we wanted to capture with Sparkle being uh, that she's young and at this uh, turning point where she could either choose uh, her career or you know her next steps after school when she's no longer being guided um, by uh, adults in her life she's becoming her own adult um, so that metaphor um, of just being on stage all the time, always having to be presentable, always having an audience for the kind of uh, person that you wanna be or the performance that you wanna give and trying to always make every moment uh, the best and sort of sell it yourself. Um, there are so many uh, parallels for that in, in the film. And uh, even though Sparkle is um, sort of performing so much and she gets better as a performer th throughout the film, 
uh, we still get to see her vulnerable and uh, not performing and sort of see who she is uh, when she's figuring all of these things out for the first time. We see the face she puts out to the world and then the face she wears when she's not out of the world. Exactly. And you captured that so well and Onessa, you captured it so well. So I was interested in, in sort of the fact that it is such a universal story and you're talking about, you know, girlhood and, and uh, you know, everything that you, sexuality, all the, the different things that, that, you know, people experience. And yet it's a very specific story. It's very um, grounded in Trinidad and in soca music. And you know, soca music is, is placed in the forefront. So I wondered how that process came up, um, how you, you know, how you balance all that. I think for, for both Melina and I, we're very passionate about telling stories that feel like a contemporary Caribbean experience. So for me, I mean, I, I grew up in the Caribbean, but there are a lot of images that we both feel like, and we talk about this a lot, it's like in the mainstream when you think of the Caribbean, you think of beautiful landscapes and, and tourism and, and we just really wanted to tap into experience that felt like, okay, this is the Caribbean now, and this is a contemporary Caribbean space. And even if that feels gritty and a little, and you know, and not necessarily always pleasant, that's something that we wanted to do. And I mean, soca music is just such a huge part of, of what we listen to now. As a West Indians, we listen to dancehall, um, we listen to soca regularly, and, and, and it was just wanting to make sure that the world of this film reflected that contemporary Caribbean space. So what would these girls be listening to when they're in a car on their way to a party? You know, we wanted to make sure that everything in the world and the way that the music was woven into the world felt very, very real to this space. Did you choose a lot of music or did you have like a music supervisor that did that or how did that come about? Yeah, um, <laughs> we we had, uh, the, it was so funny because in the process leading up to the f shooting the film, I would message uh, some soca artists and their managers would just say, yeah, go ahead, use the music, use this and the other. But then when the film actually goes to post-production, you realize, oh no, we, have, we need a music supervisor. <laughs> <It works>. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually funny, I have texts where I would message um, you know, an artist manager and say, can we use a song? And they just go, yeah, yeah, do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, we, got a, we got a music supervisor eventually who, um, and I worked with a composer, Zane Rudolfo, and a music supervisor, Phil. And as a team, they sort of uh, helped get the rights to, you know, all the songs that we wanted to incorporate. And a lot of it changed. So the songs that we we shot to didn't necessarily stay the same all the way to the final cut. Some songs did change. Sure. Melina, some of the dialogue feels so natural and so authentic. And that's a testimony, I'm sure, to your writing. Did you also have some improvisation? I was thinking of like a line like, put some pepper in them hips, or you know, like lines like that. I'm wondering if if you encourage improvisation, if there was improvisation, or if it was tightly scripted, or both. Um, well, it was actually that's a testament to Maya uh, uh, hugely because a lot of the situational things that we planned out as far as scene work and moving the characters around, that was something that we mulled over for many weeks. But when it came down to slang and making it sound like it was really from Trinidad, that was something that I um, like uh, really had to reference Maya for and uh, she brought all that language back in for us. Yeah, and even, I mean, it goes beyond Melina and I because even the girls brought their own thing. <laughs> so it's like, sometimes uh, it, like a piece of dialogue would go from, if she wrote it, it would go from Melina to me and then, and then the girls who would say, you know, and it was just that kind of collaborative experience. Um, and I think one, one scene in there is improvised, the one when they're in the car on their way yeah. to a party and they're just- Oh, like, that <laughs> seems really, yeah, because it's so yeah. natural. Yeah. yeah. So that you scene just... is completely improvised and it was just, and you could tell, what I loved about this shooting experience is that you could tell all the girls felt so connected to their characters. They really enjoyed their characters. So they just had so much energy and they just wanted to pitch, like bring their ideas. And, and you know, I remember sometimes Shan was saying, you know, I feel like I can do this. Can I do this? Yeah. I do this? <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like my character would do this. Yeah, like, sometimes. Would that. <laughs> yeah. Did you do that too, Anessa? And was there, was there something you remember specifically that you asked to do that was different? Maya would like, 
to, because we want the characters to be so um so natural. If we we had a line that probably sung um. American, I American. Oh so yeah, yeah, no, yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> If we had a line that sung very um American, she was like. Mm-hmm. Um, Say it like a trini. Like say it <laughs> like a trini. That's so cute. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because it felt very, very real, and uh, that's. I love that it was a whole collaborative effort like that. That's fantastic. Um, did you feel like you're talking about how people's image of the Caribbean is, you know, vacations and palm trees and beaches and stuff? Did you feel there were certain stereotypes you were trying to work around oh about? God the Caribbean. Yes, you're nodding, Melina. That was the whole thing. So I, my father was born in Jamaica and I had an, a holy uh, American experience growing up. We were pretty assimilated and I learned a lot about the Caribbean from my grandparents, from, you know, family get togethers and films. And I felt like all films that I saw from the Caribbean were just beach, good times, all, and there was no real characters, there were no real stories that I could latch on to. The culture was very one-sided. It, every, it was always a vacation film or, or a film where people would come to the island to have a good time and then leave and go back to their, their normal lives. And I really was so excited to work with Maya and work with an artist who was going to bring a story uh, to where they were from in the Caribbean write about real characters having real lives in the Caribbean that didn't revolve around the American idea of what the Caribbean is. So that was something that was very impactful, important for me as a writer and also as a young Caribbean American person. Yes, totally. Yeah, that makes, and that comes through. I I was thinking about a movie like Moonlight where you really got a sense of place, that place in Florida, and you really get a sense of place in your film. And and yet there's a universality, again, of, you know, coming of age and and finding your crew and all of that. Um, I want to ask both of you what initially drew you, you you went through film school, so what initially drew both of you to filmmaking? I feel like I only really got into filmmaking at the college level. Um, So I... I, as I said, I was a dancer, I modeled, I was, I was doing everything when I was in high school. I remember one of the most exciting memories I have was when I was 17, I got a little extra part on a Nicki Minaj video that Hype Williams flew to Trinidad to shoot. <laughs> um, yeah. but filmmaking was something that I always was very fascinated by, but I always felt a little embarrassed by the idea. It was not something that I would comfortably tell someone, oh, I, I want to be a director or a filmmaker because it just felt so far-fetched, especially coming from a small place. And I remember being on set for that music video Video and seeing three or four steady cam operators and the director and thinking well this is this is such a cool fascinating um you know medium um but i both of my parents are artists um and i also um have a background in painting and sculpture so i enrolled at art school knowing that i wanted to do something creative but not quite sure where i fit in and i started taking film classes and hanging out with film students there and when they started talking to me about their short films and casting i i just gravitated towards it and i actually shot my first uh, film about my best friend who was a dancer with a circus um i shot it myself on a dslr i edited it myself i did i mean i did the whole process and i really just fell in love with the process of making a film about something that I was very close to because it was my best friend that I was filming the entire time and about subject matter that I that I loved and I felt like oh you know this this camera is a tool it's, it's almost like an extension of my own reality and I found so much power in being able to to tell my own stories in that small experience of just making that film and then so that's kind of how I got into filmmaking. That's so interesting. And Melina, how about you? Um, well, I went to a, an arts middle school and high school. So I was actually training to be an actress for eight years in my youth. Um, and I had a lot of experience doing other people's lines. And, you know, from Shakespeare to classical to modern theater. And I really found myself a little frustrated with all of the material that I was being handed and, and the lack of the breadth and not seeing myself in any characters. Um, so when I made the decision to go to college, I wanted to m- make the switch to film, but not necessarily as a film actress. So I said, you know, what is missing? What is really what I feel like I want to see and accomplish? And it, that really drew, drew me to writing. So I started off um, my studies uh, for a few years and then switched over to screenwriting. And then 
also switched over and went and got a sociology minor as well because I was so interested in doing character studies and people and really finding what it is to, to make a character and see yourself in the material that you're trying to make. Um, so what drew me to film necessarily was um, not being able to see myself in it for so many years. I think that's so great. It's, we need so many more women, people of color, people from different points of view. I mean, it, you have the Caribbean point of view, which is something that we don't see very much in American films. So all of that is so it's really interesting. How about you, Onessa? How do you see yourself acting more? Or what is this opened up a whole new world for you? <laughs> I, I'm, so, I'm so nervous about the idea. I would love, love that to happen. But like Maya said, was so amazing and so homey is the best way I could find. It was just so amazing. I feel like I got lucky and I wouldn't, I wouldn't find that. Like, I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> what she's trying to say, she doesn't want to work with anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Already getting so picky. <laughs> Well, so Maya, you're, you're on the hook here. Now you have to make more movies. Quickly. <laughs> So yeah, you got very, it sounds like a really ideal first experience. Yeah, it definitely so, was. Definitely yeah. Unforgettable. I love the idea of a homey set too. That's yeah, great. It was so amazing. Everybody felt like family. It was amazing. Oh. Yeah. So um, are you working on something? Is there something you're going to be working on coming up together? The two, Melina and, and Maya, do you, do you like want to work on continue working on projects together or what is the look Sure, like? I mean, we're still kind of writing off of this. Um, totally. But I'm open to the idea, you know, I'm always throwing ideas around. <laughs> you make such a good pair, so it just seems like Thanks. the writer direct your pair. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on other stories that are coming from the region or that have come from the region? Because I, I feel like we don't see enough of films from the Caribbean, but yeah. do you have recommendations? Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, and I could say in the last few years, a lot of a lot more than we're used to because growing up as a Caribbean pe person, you know, the films that you hear about are very specific. You hear about how did they come? I mean, that's a classic. You know, everyone classic, watch. yeah. You know, rockers in Trinidad, we have um, Femme and a few others, but it really is just a small handful of films. And what's been really exciting in the last few years is that you're seeing more films coming out of the region because people have access and the technology is easier to access. And so we have this new tool where we can make things on a micro budget. And, and you know, even with my film or other films that I've seen from Trinidad in the last few years, it just enables us to, you know, shoot something on a DSLR or like just make things. And, there's an interesting trend here in Trinidad. Um, so we have a genre of music, uh, like it's called like Zessa music. Yeah, <laughs> and it's what, Trinidad. It's like it's called Trinidad. Yeah. So it's Trinidad dancehall, and this style of music was born out of certain communities that have a lot of issues with gang violence. Um, but what's interesting is that this zest movement is also being accompanied with zest films. <laughs> um, and, and so many people rent these films. I've sat down and watched these films. And what I find so exciting about it is even though the audio isn't great or they may have used camera audio sometimes, I'm getting into a world and I'm getting to see or feel the experience of someone telling their own story. It doesn't feel like an outsider looking. In. Mm -hmm. and I just find that so exciting, you know, coming from Trinidad, but also the Caribbean. And there've been some films too that have crossed over to the mainstream, like Sprinters now on Netflix. Um, and that came out of Jamaica. So I think there's so many levels that you have, you know, the, the films being shot on the SLRs <laughs> that, you, that I would still sit down and enjoy. <laughs> um, I love, and then, and then the ones that are also like getting more traction and going to Netflix. And it's just really exciting to see that more is being produced. Absolutely, yeah. No, that is, well, your film was so great. And I'm so, I, I just love the exuberance of it. I feel like we were just so immersed in, in the world there. So um, thank you so much, Maya, Melina, and Onessa. I wish you all lots of luck in the future and congratulations on this wonderful film. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us and thanks everyone who's tuning in. Thanks for being here today. 
please tell your friends and tell them to see She Paradise. And this film is available to screen until the end of the festival, which is October 22nd at 11.59 p.m. Uh, we'd love to hear from you on social media, hashtag AFI Fest. And please join us for more great films and virtual events at fest.afi.com. Thank you.